Um, so we're now live for anybody that is coming in and there are people signing in right now. I can see the numbers going up. So there are people uh, who can now see us online and welcome as you join us right now. We're up to 13 people and um, this number will continue to climb. And uh, once we get to around 30 or so, we'll, we'll give it a few minutes before we actually start here and I introduce everybody. But uh, we're, we're climbing now, 21 people present who, uh, with this format, um, right now I just see that the participants who are with me today for this seminar, but there are uh, actually currently about 24 of you out there from all around the world that are joining us at this moment in time. And though we can't see you, um, I, am, I just see the panel just like you do. So up to 25 and climbing. And um, I welcome all of you right now uh, to this incredible world of, of Zoom where we can actually interact with, with so many people around the world and um, to be present here with this incredible panel of people who I am so honored to have join me here. Um, we are, it's now noon and um, as people join us, I will just give it a couple more minutes here as we prepare to take off. And uh, make sure we've all got our phones off and ready to go here. So we seem to be stable with the numbers, although I'm sure some more people will be joining us as we go along. But it is noon and it is time to get this seminar started. And I'd like to first of all introduce myself and the, the Holler Center who are hosting this seminar. Um, I'm Linda Law. I'm the executive director of the Holler Center and the founder of the Virtual Museum of Holography, which you will learn more about as we go along. The Holler Center was founded by uh, Dr. Anna Maria Nicholson and the late Dan Schweitzer back in the late 90s. And with a, an, a, a grant from the Shearwater Foundation, which had been administered by Percy Jackson here, who's with us today. So the, the mission of the Holo Center is to provide access for artists to facilities to make holographic art, to create exhibitions of holographic art, to educate about holography and to research new techniques for creating holograms. The, the Virtual Museum of Holography is a new project of the Holo Center, which is designed to create an online repository of information about the art, science, and technology of holography. And it also is designed to have an immersive virtual reality portal into a, basically a dimensional holographic museum of virtual holograms. So these are being created with new technology, with new light field technology. So this seminar is the first of a series of monthly seminars. Um, and the first three of these are on the topic of what is a hologram. And this has come about because we are currently flooded with many different descriptions of what a hologram is from everything from uh, Pepper's ghost displays, 3D projection mapping, lenticular images, volumetric images, photogrammetry, VR, AR, all of them are being described as holograms. So this first seminar with this particular panel of people has been designed to explore what the original definition of the hologram was and continues to be and how it is evolving. So I'd like to begin by introducing my incredible panel. Um, we are so lucky to have all these people with us here today. First of all, Dr. Eurus Yupatniks, uh, 
I actually was trying to track him down for months and it's only a couple of weeks ago that we managed to reach him and I am so thrilled that he's with us here today. Dr. Yupatniks was born in 1936 in Riga, Riga, Riga Latvia. At the close of World War II, um, he, with his family, they fled to Germany um, because of the Soviet occupation of Latvia, seeking asylum in Germany. In 1951, the family emigrated to the USA. In 1960, he obtained his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Akron. And from there on, he studied at the Institute of Science and Technology, where he obtained a master's in electrical engineering. From 1961 to 62, he served in the army uh, through the ROTC. And in 62, he returned to work with Emmett Leith in Michigan, where they made the first holograms with, with a laser. Prior to this, they had been actually working with mercury arc lamps to make holograms. In 1965, Emmett and Juris demonstrated their first 3D holograms at a, a meeting at a conference in Washington, DC, where they had scientists queuing up down the hallways to, to have a look at these holograms, the first ones that anybody had really seen. In uh, 62 to 64, he and Emmett published a series of technical papers on holography. And as of 2009, he holds 19 patents. In 1975, he received the R.W. Wood Prize of the Optical Society of America. In 1976, he received the Holly Medal of the American Society of Invention and Innovation. And in 1999, he received the Latvian Academy of Sciences uh, Award of the Great Medal. So we really are just thrilled to have you with us here today. Um, now, Dr. Kenneth Haynes, he, Dr. Haynes graduated from uh, Queen's University in Canada in 1956. And in the early 60s, he was a member of the team which um, pioneered holography under the tutelage of Emmett Leith at the University of Michigan where he obtained his PhD. In 1967, he served as the chief technology officer for Holotron Corporation, a subsidiary of DuPont company. In 71, he, uh, he was on the teaching staff of, of the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. In 1978, he founded Eidetic Images where he developed mass production techniques for holography. In 82, Eidetic images were acquired by American Banknote. And as a result, um, he did totally groundbreaking work in, in mass production. In fact, just about everybody in this audience today, I would imagine has got a credit card with a hologram on it that was actually made by him. So uh, he served as the, um, oh, he also did three covers for National Geographic. Uh, in the 80s that were totally groundbreaking. He served as the senior vice president for a American Banknote Holographics and was in charge of research and development. In 1992, he started Sumian Technologies to develop advanced holographic recording systems using computer process data. Sumian was sold to RPM in 1995 and he left in 1996. He has worked as a consultant of the field since then. So welcome, Ken. We're really happy to have you with us here today too. So Percy Jackson. Percy was born and raised in New York City. She studied at the Parsons School of Design and obtained a degree in photography and graphic design. On graduation, she founded her own company, Jackson Graphics. A summer course in holography at Lake Forest College in 1970, and later courses at the New York School of Holography in 75 and 76, cemented her lifelong interest in the medium. After, after producing displays and exhibits for the 
New York Art Alliance, including co-creating the, the Holography 75 exhibition at ICP. She founded the Museum of Holography, serving as its director through 1983. And I'd like to just add there that that exhibition at ICP was my entry point into holography too. That's when I saw my very first hologram and thank you to Posey for that exhibition <laughs> and, and to Jodie Burns who co-created it with her. <laughs> um, so from 87 to, uh, so wait a minute. Um, she served as the director of the Museum of Holography through 1983. And I'd also like to add there that that period of time in holography was a most stimulating and creative period. And the museum was really the hub of a great deal of creative activity that happened in New York City at that time. And it became a focal point for people when they came to New York. So from 87 to 98, she created and directed the holography program for the Shearwater Foundation which continued until 2004. And many, many artists received incredible awards from the Shearwater Foundation. You couldn't apply for one, you just were nominated and uh, then just got the surprise award. And many different groups of artists and projects benefited through that foundation. So from um, 83 to 96, she lived on the island of, of Exuma in the Bahamas, where she started our father's business, a community food distribution service for the elderly and indigent. From 98 to 2001, she attended a seminary in the Southwest in Austin and directed from 2001 to 2006, directed the William Temple Episcopal Center. In 2004, she was ordained and has since held several positions as a priest. Well, Composey, we were just so glad to have you here. <laughs> and Jim Trollinger, Dr. Jim Trollinger. Jim is an optical physicist who has devoted his entire career to the pioneering development and fielding of laser-based state-of-the-art optical diagnostic methods, especially in applied holography. He has co-founded two successful high-tech optical companies, the Spectron Development Labs Inc, Metro Laser Inc, where he worked since 1988. He has published over 150 papers about optical diagnostic methods, including fielding hollow cameras in planes for cloud particle studies. He even flew in NASA's microgravity lab, which was known also as the Vomit Comet, and um, in preparation for space flight holography. His broad base of knowledge and long history of research will be invaluable today as we explore what is a hologram. So on Friday, we had a practice session for the panel and um, I was actually totally delighted to discover that it was also Eurus's 85th birthday. So late happy birthday to you from all of us, Eurus. That was just such an amazing thing. And we had, we had also originally tried to, to plan this se seminar for a little bit earlier because I wanted to originally coincide it with Ken's birthday, which had been on May 20th when he turned 88. Mm -hmm. But uh, we didn't, it was too soon. We couldn't quite do that. And, and anyway, it meant that we had a little bit longer and we managed to contact you and we have you all with us now today. Mm -hmm. But on Friday, you um, gave us a really wonderful description of what it was like making that first hologram. Mm -hmm. And I, I would like to invite you to start us off by talking about your early experience in making a hologram in Michigan with Emmett Leith in those mm -hmm. early days, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, well, there are <laughs> three different um, kind of uh, se sections. Uh, the earliest one <clears throat> was uh, the very first recording of an off-axis hologram was uh, made in uh, March 1961. And um, at that time, um, 
we didn't have a laser, so only mercury arc lamps and semi-coherent light sources. And Emmett was writing his uh, uh, paper communication theory and optics and uh, making some uh, photographic uh, illustrations. And uh, the one we couldn't do was to de demonstrate the off-axis hologram. <clears throat> but then I was in the laboratory looking at the uh, paper. There was a paper that described how a uh, Ronke ruling when it imaged and when you change, uh, blocked it, some of the diffracted lines in the transform plane that it changed the sharpness and how the image changed. And so while looking at that, I thought, well, what happens if I select only two points from those and over 10 diffracted spots? And of course there was, looked like interference lines and it was very contrasty all across the field. So um, then I selected these two points and uh, placed a very fine copper wire near just uh, near the focus point just where before the two beams overlapped and then made a recording in the image plane. So that was the first off-axis hologram. And, and then when you replace the film back in a converging beam, you could clearly see reconstruction of this black line on, on one side of the focus point of the main beam before that point, uh, focus point. And on the other opposite side, it was behind the uh, focus point. So it was exactly as predicted. It was the real and conjugate images. Um, and um, Emmett included uh, some photograph of the of this experiment at the end of his paper. Um, then in uh, 1962, we tried to make uh, some more holograms and then the first laser came ar around and uh, we had uh, my colleague, um, Bud Wunderlut had uh, managed to buy one of the first lasers, which was really expensive, something like $10,000. And in those days, 10,000 was really a lot of money. And uh, he was in the adjoining room. So <laughs> we put in a mirror and uh, borrowed the beam <laughs> to our uh, optical bench in the adjoining room. And then with that, we could make the first uh, holograms of transparencies. Uh, of continuous tone transparencies. And uh, those were published in the uh, second paper. And uh, then the three-dimensional holograms. So yes, and then uh, when this uh, paper appeared in uh, December 19, let's see, 1963, um, the uh, uh, Physical Society of America uh, released a press release about the holograph holograms and uh, Emmett received many telephone calls inquiring about it was kind of headline was lensless photography something like that and um, when he answered the interviews uh, he uh, added by the way that uh, we could also record three-dimensional objects or images and uh, the uh, reporters certainly didn't believe it. They asked if he, that he had done it and he hadn't, but he kind of said, well, it was obvious that you could do that, but uh, they certainly doubted that. So in their reports, they never mentioned that holograms were three-dimensional, could record three-dimensional images. And uh, th so this was in December 5, 1963. So as, as right after that, we immediately went to the lab and started to set up to record a reflective hologram of this uh, little train that we borrowed from one of our technicians in the laboratory. And um, at first we didn't get any results. The, there were stability problems and the beams were be not equalized reference and object beams were not equalized. So. At first, we just got blank films, 
but then uh, in, uh, at the, in the last week of December 1963, we finally succeeded in making one good hologram, a uh, four by five inch hologram of this little train. Uh, and uh, we were really excited to see that because it was so realistic, even though it's, we knew it should be realistic, but it was something else to see it. And then once uh, uh, we saw it, we also started showing other our colleagues in the laboratory and, and then the management. So we had a continuous stream of people coming and looking at this uh, first hologram. Uh, so that's about the story. So the first hologram was made in uh, December, end of December, 1963. And then we continued in 64 and tried to improve on that. That must have been such an exciting time in the lab. Yes. And then this hologram was demonstrated in Washington, D.C. There was a conference in May of 1964. And we brought the hologram along with the, and uh, the spectrophysics and Perkin Elmer, I, I think they were joined at the time brought a laser for demonstration in one of the uh, hotel rooms near the conference. And so they brought the laser, we brought the hologram and we just played both of them. And there were many, many people coming. They were kind of lining up to see it. The hologram was four by five inches and really one person at a time could look at it. So that was a very successful demonstration, I think, both for us and the uh, Spectrophysics Perkin Elmer com Company, too. Well, to continue on, um, I'd like to invite you to kick us off on your definition of a hologram. Because that's what this seminar was really going to do to mm -hmm. explore uh, how, what, how you see. Uh, okay, my definition is that a hologram is the recording of the interference pattern between a reference beam and light coming from the object either is selected or transmitted. And so it's the interference between light coming from the object and the reference beam and that interference pattern is recorded. Uh, and that is then called a hologram. Well, we've actually been meeting as a group on and off for uh, over a few months, discussing all of this and exploring these different parts. And the, I, I'm very aware that both Ken and Jim have been accumulating definitions of holograms, pages of them, from what I understand, um, oh. <laughs> uh, for some time now. So I'd like you all to join in and and contribute to your definitions of what a hologram is. So either Ken or Jim or Posey, would you all like to contribute? So maybe yours kick us off, Jim. You've got that long list. Well, <clears throat> defining a hologram is a lot more complicated than, than one might think because the, at least my perspective on holography from today, it, it contains such a vast array and combination of different recording materials, wavelengths, applications, uh, the different communities that are using it. it it's, a, it's a vast collection of different categories of, of holograms that makes this complicated. So it, it's probably more practical to begin as Uris did with the definition of an optical hologram. And, and uh, an optical hologram is, is a recording of a light wave with enough information that that same light wave can be reconstructed almost exactly at some later time. So that, that covers optical holography. And then to, to generalize that, you'd say any wave a uh, hologram is a recording, a complete recording of any wave such that it can be reconstructed. That includes radar, which I think the first holograms were, were, uh, were those off or the uh, side looking radar recordings. At that time, you just didn't know to call it a hologram. 
Uh, there, you can record water waves, you can record x-ray sound waves as a full, whole field of acoustical holography. So, uh, and then there's digital holograph holography where you record synthetic waves. You, you never actually have a wave, you synthesize the wave and the hologram is actually existing inside the computer memory. <clears throat> so all of these things complicate the definition of holography. So what, what people are most likely to see is the optical hologram hanging on the wall. And in that case, the hologram reconstructs that light, that light field from an object so well that when you're looking at the hologram, you're looking at exactly the same thing you would see if you were looking at the object. So it, it gives a full 3D realistic view because it has the ability to record and reconstruct <clears throat> that same light field. So <clears throat> that would be um, um, what I would consider a more broad definition recording of any wave. And there, there's so many different types of applications of that in so many different fields that uh, uh, I think each one has its own different definitions. Well, can I say something? Of course. <laughs> yeah, well, I would say that uh, the SAR, uh, synthetic aperture radar, is not a hologram. And uh, because a hologram is a, the definition of, of the word itself is that it's a complete recording and it records widths, depths, depths and elevation heights. So it records three dimensions where uh, the SAR image is only one dimensional re in reality. So. Yeah, I wouldn't call it um, a hologram because it doesn't record the other dimensions. Uh, it, it has some qualities that are similar to holograms, but it is uh, not a holographic recording, I would say. I think it's more than two dimensions. You're actually <clears throat> you're recording heights. <clears throat> you can actually look at the height of the ground below the airplane. So you're measuring a profile. It's not just a flat picture, it's a profile. So you are measuring three dimensions in that sense. Now, mm -hmm. to make a comment about well, what a hologram is, it need not be 3D. Right. And there are most, most mm -hmm. holograms that we see in the public are not 3D, they're produced. Uh, I think that Emmett at one time, we were discussing this and he said, look, do you recall those early SAR side looking radar images, which were on tilted plane? You know, remember that before they improved that and modified it was a flat plane. And that tilted plane, he said, is really, a, was really a rainbow hologram. He certainly thought of it as a hologram at certain points. Okay, so that's what he thought. I have some records on that. Um, when I think of a hologram, I don't know what a light field is. Maybe some... Oops, you froze, Ken. ...addition of a light field. No? You lost sound. Hmm? Are you there? Keep going. Oh, okay. I think Ken was asking for a definition of a light field. Would you like to take that on, Jim? <clears throat> well, the, uh, we normally should talk about wavefronts because, I mean, that's okay. what Gabor, Gabor and Lee, they all talked about wavefront reconstructions. Okay. So, uh, the light field is a full, all the electromagnetic properties through the whole field. And that, that's right. probably not, not useful. Not, we should stick to the light waves. All right, can I make a comment about that? I would say that 50% of the holograms, more modern holograms were not made from a wavefront. They were made from a collection of photographs. Mm -hmm. And one cannot tell the difference. We made millions of holograms that way. Um, so you could say the hologram, it was a hologram of the photographs mm -hmm. and what they represented was all done in the computer. 
And so I'm very cautious about saying it's a light field, actually interference pattern. To me, it never was, at least not in the last 20 years. It was much more than that. And whatever you recorded is what you got. So if you collected the data from a whole bunch of photographs, you could synthetically create images in the computer and you could use that data to create holograms. All of the millions of holograms we made of all of the major league players, baseball players and that, were all made that way. And every time you see holograms of individuals, they probably were made that way. And we're going all the way back to, oh, I can't remember his name now, the original holograms in a drum. Uh, so think, Lloyd think, Cross holograms we talking you yeah, thanks to. thanks a lot Lloyd Cross and so when I tried to define what a hologram was and and, and Jim and I have been working on this I tried to define make a very brief definition the briefest I could make which included what I thought were genuine holograms and those genuine holograms were were lethal new patniacs they were they were Denishuk, uh, they were reflection holograms, they were, well, anyway, Denishuk, Leith and Eupatniaks, and who else would be in there? Um, trying to think, there's one other, who do you think would have generated real holograms? They would be, yeah, they would be. Well, yeah, well, then it's your... oh, there would there would be Gabor. Yes, Gabor, Elise, and, and Elise myself, and and that and Yuri Denisuk. You you had mentioned Denisuk, and those are the three. I said those three gen were really the creators of what I would call a hologram, mm -hmm. at least in the technical sense. So, and I included in my definition, holograms that were made from photographs as well, because that's what people think of as a hologram. In fact, probably most people think of a hologram that was not made from the interference of an object wave and a reference wave. Millions of them. My definition, and we can take it apart, is a hologram is the complete recording of a complex wavefront which can be used at a later time to regenerate a perfect copy of that wave. There is a problem with perfect. Hmm. Yeah. Well, but. But if you make a hologram of a photograph, uh, that's still, you know, <laughs> you have the depth information and uh, lateral information. So you don't use the three dimensions, but it's uh, there. Yeah, just because the wavefront is made up of a collection of photographs doesn't mean it's not a wavefront. And mm -hmm. and you, I think you're, I, I agree, and I have the same, we've kind of honed in on the definition of a recording of, of any complex wavefront with such accuracy that you can reconstruct that same wavefront at a later time. Uh, that, 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 that we agree on, I think. The, yeah. the the thing is what what is what qualifies as a wavefront in digital holography you don't actually have a wavefront sometimes you synthesize it you do it in the computer you can make the hologram in the computer without having a laser or you without having light without having anything you synthesize it you can make it in the computer you can reconstruct the wavefront in the computer you can interfere it you can you can do almost everything and eventually displaying it on a on a tv monitor but uh, so maybe we, we have to decide on what qualifies as a wavefront well um posy didn't you have some thoughts on this question of the accessibility of the term wavefront <laughs> okay the luddite speaks up um, <laughs> I'm approaching holography um, as an artist, a graphic designer, a cultural anthropologist, a theologian. Um, and, and what amazes me in all of our discussions about what is a hologram, 
is that no one ever talks about the space. What flattened me when I first saw a hologram was I saw a way to image and reconstruct, sorry about these terms, but they are what they are, space. You're all talking about an object in the space. I'm talking about the fact that for the first time in recorded history, we have a phenomenon that can I'm stuck on the word. I'm trying to think of a good word that can freeze, that can image um, and reproduce space and objects within that space. Think about it. For the entire history of human beings, we've been dealing with flat surfaces, unless you're a sculptor or an architect. You've been dealing with what do I do with this flat piece of paper and how do I make it look like the object, which isn't flat. And for the first time, we have a medium, uh, classical optical holography, that can do that. We used to have a button at the museum that said holography saves space. <laughs> because to me and to a lot of people who do not know what a Fourier transform is, um, a lot of people coming into the museum are absolutely fascinated by the fact that spatial relationships can be delivered to you off of a glass plate or from an image on the wall. They're not quite sure exactly what the substrate is there. But so to me, the, the excitement and the challenge um, of, of optical holography is what do we do as creative people with the fact that we can now image objects in relationship to each other within a volume. To me, that's absolutely revolutionary and fascinating. And because I don't understand a lot of the physics, um, I go straight to the end product and say, mm -hmm. wow, you know. Um. Right. So, so maybe what we need here is a technical, as, as Jim said, we need a technical description, which is accurate. And we need another description, which is more for the public, but still true. It can still be accurate, yeah. And, and here's the thing that ties the two together is that, and all of the originators would say that it's like looking through a window and all, all the space information you see out there passes through the window. The window freezes all the waves coming through it. And that is what constitutes a hologram. Mm -hmm. Now I can take all those waves through what come through it and I can Go to China and I can turn it on again and they, there they are, they regenerated. Mm -hmm. That connects, I think, a popular idea of holography and a very technical one. But my definition that I tried, which ought to be torn apart, is a hologram is a complete recording of a complex wave front. Mm -hmm. Because I thought that captures both, but unfortunately it has technical terms in it. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, Posey. We've got to have something that's more understandable and all that. It's mm -hmm. okay. It's okay. Complex well, wave front is okay. I, I want to know, though, Jim, what do you think of... Uh, you were the one that suggested that we have to have a technical term that describes it, and we have to have a popular one. But for the technical term, I if you want to make it as brief as you can, so it, 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 it covers everything. Those three holograms that I mentioned, Lisa Nupatniak's Gabor and Denishuk, it captures that. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't capture, say, lenticular photographs or- And they, yeah, and they are- 
They aren't holograms, though. I mean, no. in take they are not. Yeah. They are not. Yeah. So you don't want it to. You want it yeah. to exclude. So that that's where I am. I don't. I don't think I'm capable of making a, a statement that's popular. I don't think I'm creative enough. Yeah, well, maybe Posey is more qualified. I mean, one one thing that Posey might like, and I. I, I I, ran, I was looking for a person here and you're telling me <laughs> different people. I, I liked Dennis Shuck's description that Posey might actually like. Uh, Dennis Shuck actually said that a hologram is the optical equivalent of the object itself. So because what comes off of the object when you're looking at it is a light wave. If you look at that light wave, you see the object. If you look at a hologram of that object, you see the object the same as you would see it if it was a real object. So he, he described it as the optical equivalent of the object itself. Yeah. I would modify his definition slightly. Yeah, okay. But And I would say it's not just optical. You know, we can add terms to that. Yeah. But that statement, now that I look at it, and now you mention that, and now Posey said what she did, it's pretty good. What I, you know, this is a good point, I think, to bring up what you all have mentioned before, um, which is that we, it is important for us to make a distinction between the um, recording object, substrate, but give me the right word there, the recording medium um, being the hologram and the resulting re-illuminated object, whatever that is, um, is not a hologram. Oh. Because we, we've had this discussion and I understand your point that, that scientifically in terms of physics, the projected image of light, the focused image in space, um, according to your definition of holography is not a hologram. It may be a holographic image, using that word as an adjective, but but it's not a noun. It's not yeah. the image itself. So maybe you all could comment on that. Well, I think Jim, uh, Jim's the person to comment on that because he has written extensively about that. I think that was one of the problems. One of the problems is that when when people, and unfortunately, when holography people themselves started referring to the three-dimensional images as the hologram, that caused a problem. And now everybody calls, uh, so many people call the image the hologram, and that confuses them because now the many people in public, anytime they see a three-dimensional image, they think it's a hologram. So if we could just get people to stop calling the image a hologram, that might actually help. Oh, but it's so sexy. That's why <laughs> everybody uses it. <laughs> because I, I am a hologram. It's a holographic image. It's Pepper's ghost, you know, <laughs> but never mind. Uh, you call it a hologram and another 100,000 people will show up. So we're stuck, unfortunately, with the fact that holography um, is, is infinitely fascinating to many different kinds of people and that the artists and the, uh, the imaging, the image makers and users of holography are probably gonna keep calling these wonderful, sexy aerial images holograms. So what? You may be right, because if you look at most of the dictionaries now, if you look up the definition of hologram, the first thing they say, it's a three-dimensional image. They, they talk about it being an image. And I mean, I, I know that's not correct, but maybe we're stuck with it. Well, wait a minute. Aren't we here talking about correcting it? Aren't we here to talk about defining holography the way it should be defined? Don't we have to, a duty to do that? I hope so. <laughs> and, and if you say that that object, the image, is not the hologram, isn't that exactly what we want to do? Yeah. Linda? The holographic image. Yes. It is an, an image that was arrived at through holographic means, just like a photographic image 
you know, is some is a, a two dimensional image arrived mm -hmm. at through photography. Um, yeah, I, I think the the problem that we always come up with is that holography is a banquet and everybody likes a different part of the meal mm -hmm. or everyone is interested and involved in a slightly different part of the meal. And so to them, that's the whole package. Yeah. You know, one person likes the olives, somebody else likes the spaghetti. And uh, I think it's, it's important to remember the technical framework that all of this rides on, if only for the sake of um, the poor artist who was not trained in physics, um, who has to master all of this technology in order to create an image. Um, because not that I think it was easy for any of you to do what you're doing, but you were at least trained in that to begin with. And what has always fascinated me is that uh, artists would come in and say, I want to learn how to do that. And they would, it would take a lot of time and energy and God knows a lot of patience, but they would be able to do something. In fact, um, in the time that I was involved in holography, which was certainly a very early period of time, some of the most innovative techniques were produced by this combination artist, entrepreneur, um, techie, whatever you want to call them, but they were not people who worked professionally in labs and who had degrees in um, physics or you know, whatever. Uh, they were people who were, who simply were, were going to work as hard as they could to come up with the image that was in their mind that they wanted to see and make happen. So we're dealing with really sort of two different audiences here. Uh, yes. We, we've been getting... that, I'm sorry, Ken. Isn't that exactly what we want? Isn't that what Jim is proposing? That we do Not have these two sure. definitions? Well, we've been getting some comments from the audience here that you might I want see. to hear too. I've been trying to read those. <laughs> yeah, there's some interesting ones. <laughs> trying to read them now. There's, there's one from Mark Diamond here that says, uh, that's what I say. Way sexier to call, to say Tupac, for instance, is a hologram as saying it is black video on a scrim. Um, George Stadnick says, oh, if I can get it to sc scroll down from here. Um, it's about the perception of the image. And um, Arlene Jurowitz says, yes, I appreciate the schemata from Margaret Benyon's phases catalog. Um, Colin Suba uh, might be worth accepting a bit of an impreciseness in order to get all of the positive marketing from it. Um, uh, Tara Johansson says, this is a problem of language. From a Native American perspective, there are no nouns but verbs. Everything is moving. Um, uh, Kel, I can't quite read it. Kel D, um, I've always referred to each part as the recorded hologram and reconstructed hologram. Um, and Mark has just put, chimed in again with, Colin, you are right. I've always said any good 3D experience reflects well on all 3D imaging experiences. It's been apparent for some time now that the language is evolving so as to mean that any cool 3D apparition of a thing is a hologram. I am afraid that that ship has sailed and in 98% of the population, anything that happens 3D-ish is a hologram. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wonder if it's possible. I mean, if enough of us get together and agree on a definition, <laughs> is it possible to erase all of these definitions? I mean, look in Webster's dictionary. How does one get Webster to change his definition to something that's correct? Hey, I'm just happy people don't call them holographs anymore, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I still asking the question, what was wrong with Jim's suggestion? We, we can define accurately what the hologram is 
if we if we consider those three originators and make sure that it includes that, and it doesn't include stuff like lenticular images. I see Bob has I, a comment. Why can't we proceed that? Why can't we make that a goal? Bob well, they can do a lot of stuff that nobody else out there is going to pay any attention to. <laughs> <laughs> Would you send Posey out? She'd <laughs> um, there's a comment here from Bob Hess that I should read. He said, I have a couple to add. An image becomes a hologram when it's rendered interferometrically with a coherent reference source. An image becomes holographic when the technique of holography or holograms are used to create, record, or project the image. So how do you feel about that one? I've got to define what holographic means and all of that. But yours. Not that different. I know yours, yours has a great definition of a hologram, the pure hologram. Those are the holograms made very early. But purity is gone from a hologram now. It, there's so many things. So I'm asking Eurus if, if he would back off from saying it's an interference pattern. That's, that's a, gl a glitch for a lot of them. Well, it's uh, only in the sense that maybe the interference pattern can be calculated by you know, a computer, mm -hmm. but um, you know, so instead of having a recording a real interference pattern it maybe can be calculated and then written that way but uh, so it would be simulated interference pattern it still needs to be uh, well in either interference pattern or something like interference in order to diffract light and, and form the images yeah and like and I was thinking I was about to say yours is comment about interference and diffraction one might add and we talked about this a little bit before one might add that that recording we're calling a hologram is using the principles of interference and diffraction to to make all of this happen that would eliminate all the 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 non-hologram <laughs> holograms that people that would exclude a lot of holograms that are made today from images, photographs. I don't think so, because you're still doing, you You are making interference fringes. You're calculating them or you're doing somehow, you're actually storing it in a hologram. Yeah, let's, let, let me tell you about one of the more recent things. We did take all the data from photographs and we computed for every pixel in the hologram, what the rays were and we made printed every pixel one at a time. Mm -hmm. That's very far from calculating an interference pattern. We just used the computer to do all of that and we imaged every pixel. That's pretty well, far away. But in order to uh, reconstruct an image, you had to calculate an interference pattern or equivalent to an interference pattern. Well, we calculated and printed each pixel. We created a hologram. Yeah, but it's okay. So you you created an interference equivalent interference pattern, right. except it's not by okay. recording right, but by word, calculation. Yeah, that word you used is interesting. Equivalent. Yeah. You could say that everything in the holography has an equivalent interference pattern. Every time we make a hologram, it's equivalent to making an interference pattern. Yeah, yeah that, that would work. You might also call it a synthesized, either real or synthesized, because most digital holography, or very much digital holography is synthesized. You don't actually yeah, have what? a wave front. You synthesize I, it, I, you. Yeah, we did talk about synthesized holograms, Jim. Yeah. And and we those are- Stand on that, fit, couldn't we? Those fit the definition. All right. What yeah, definition? I think the definition, Jim, that, that uh, you, that actually that the three of you have banged out are, are um, 
you know, serviceable um, and useful, but you have to know that the general public will ignore them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that artists will pick and choose what they understand yeah. and go on about their business making three-dimensional images, regardless of what the proper definition is. Um, well. And probably people who write about holography will never get it right. Okay. There's a very interesting comment here from Andrew Pepper and that I'd like to read out to you. So he says, it's interesting that many of the early non-technical makers who collaborated with scientists and engineers to access equipment and expert knowledge all struggled with the vocabulary. Artists didn't have a developed technical vocabulary mostly and scientists didn't have a specific critical vocabulary mostly. So there, are, there appears to have been clashes in how each described what they wanted from the process <laughs> slash medium. Would you like to comment on that? <laughs> well, I think it's back to the problem I mentioned at first. Holography encompasses such a vast array of, of people and applications and recording media all of those things it's not it's not a simple way to separate all those L linda lane just uh, added another one um synthesize into one simple definition i always use used to describe a hologram as the whole message a layman's definition mm -hmm. but is that adequate that's well, I'm not sure that it's 100% accurate. I mean, we used to get that a lot at the museum. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay, so if you break this hologram, every part of it will have the, the same image. It's like, no, that's yeah. not really that true. Was for a while. Um, and I, I would go back to Ken's window, but the one that worked better for me was to say, you've got a wooden door into a room and you drill a couple of holes in the door, top, bottom, and sides, and you station somebody at each hole, each person will see the accurate room on the other side of the door, but from the angle that the hole was in the door, from the perspective of the angle in the door. So if you break off the bottom right-hand corner of a laser transmission hologram, you're not gonna see a purely frontal view of an object. You're gonna see the view of an object from the bottom left-hand yeah. corner looking up because that's where the light waves from that part of the image were imaged. I mean, yes, it has the whole image, and, you know, and so that kind of fries people's brains a little mm -hmm. bit and, I think to an extent, given the fact that I listen to FM radio and I know that it has something to do with uh, carrier frequencies and I watch TV and I don't have a clue how that, you know, it's just, we're just going to have to say the parts that we understand, fine, you know, we'll go with that. And the parts we don't understand, we believe them to be true because they work. Um, but if you want me to explain a Fourier transform, I ain't gonna do it. I, I can't do it. <laughs> you know? yeah. well, that's all I know, nothing else. <laughs> can any of you guys do that? Of course you can, yeah. We're dealing with, with um, two different sides of the magic. We're dealing with people who who understand on such an amazing level exactly what's going on in that substrate and why it's happening. And there are people who really don't care what's happening in the film plane. They're interested in what Please. the projected image looks like. Mm -hmm. There's so uh, one of our participants is, has um, written out for us the Miriam Webster definition of a hologram which might be an interesting read here. A three-dimensional image reproduced from a pattern of interference produced by a split coherent beam of radiation, such as a laser. Also the pattern of interference itself. Okay, but 
Yuris had a solution. He said, an equivalent, that's an, we can create an equivalent hologram. Mm -hmm. I think we got to work with that. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have any thoughts on that, Yuris? Um, well, I, I'm not sure, could you repeat what the question was? Or Ken, would you, your question about equivalent? Well, I do think that if we have a synthetic hologram, we have to say that. Yes. Put that in there. Mm -hmm. I think Yuri said hologram like. Yeah, <laughs> or, or equivalent. Computer, computer generated I, hologram. It's so. like equivalent hologram. That's more technically accurate, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to dominate this. Well, I'm also um, interested to hear your opinion. We, we've had uh, optical holography now since, well, if we go right back to Google War since 1947. Um, but we have, and we've had been, been able to use pulse lasers to record living objects because of the shortness of their pulse. But recording real world and moving has been this, you know, impossible <laughs> to achieve. Uh, but now we're reaching into a new realm where there are different technologies appearing that are allowing the possibility of dimensional moving images without glasses, because that's always been part of my definition with holography is that you don't need glasses to see a fully three-dimensional hologram. You need glasses for many of the other techniques to, to actually see 3D. Mm -hmm. So now we're getting displays that are actually using um, uh, different systems to produce moving dimensional images. And they're using light field recordings. Oh man, they're, what's they're, light field? What's... Well, here we go. Light field and um, wave fronts. You know, light we have, to, we have to define what wave light field is. Can I just mention one particular uh, project that we did? We had to make holograms of every major league team. So probably we made a thousand holograms of people, of a person. Mm -hmm. And you have to go out in the field where they are practicing and make the hologram. Mm -hmm. That's the task. So what you do is you go out there and you put them on a little turntable between behind home plate <laughs> and it has them stand there and you make the hologram, you collect the photographs. When I collect the photographs, and is that the light field? I think the light field is akin to the wavefront. It's the collecting all of those light waves that reflect from a scene. Well, isn't that what I'm doing? Well, yes, yes. And aren't we, isn't that what you're doing when you're making a, an optical hologram and you're using a laser to record that? No. Oh, I take all these light fields and I put them in the computer. All these photographs, and I put them in the computer. And I ask the computer to sort out every pixel in the hologram that I'm constructing, all of the rays. And I collect those pertinent rays from all of the photographs I can get. So in that one pixel, it has only the exact rays coming from the right direction. That's what we did. So if you take that and you, you go from the early days of Lloyd Cross's gathering through to some of the systems that you built and then various other companies have built over the time, those that approach, isn't that really a progression into what we're now going into? Yes, I think so, sure. Field technology. Yeah. There, there is a continuity. So what I want, yeah, I, I'm sorry for being so vocal. I, I would just love to get rid of that word, word light field because a lot of people have call it their holography, light field holography. And, and I don't think that's a very good definition. I don't think that's a very good definition. I would rather say images, collect all the images you can. And that collection 
is a light field. I don't know what a light field is. But the light field could also be from uh, a 3D. So you have a 3D model in the computer, right? And oh, yeah, sure. From there, you then render out lots of different views that then are used to generate a hologram. Well, what we would do, we would build completely something in the computer. Debbie would do that. And then we would collect all the views we needed. And we, we would put them in the computer and the computer would sort out what we need in every pixel on the hologram. All the same. I'd just like to add there that uh, Ken just referred to Debbie, who is his daughter, who was the brilliant programmer who wrote all the software for the yeah. Simian technology and developed that end of things to, to Ken's optical end. To give her some credit in here too. Yeah, well, she deserves half the credit, maybe more. I think it's useful. It's always useful to have a baseline definition. Mm -hmm. Always. Um, so I think, uh, Jim, that you're, you know, the, this composite that you all have come up with is good. Um, and as we muddle our way through uh, integral holograms and digital holograms, it's important to, to try to get our, our hands around the technologies that are involved. It's important to use that word stereo that people try to avoid, um, you know, because images are compositely created um, out there in the real world. Um, so let's start with, with the classical definition of a hologram pull out optical holography and say, you know, how that applies. And then, you know, have some lines going out from that and try to define what is white light transmission, what's a rainbow, what's a, you know, integral hologram, what's a digital hologram. It's always useful to have the correct definition, whether people use it or not, whether they care about knowing what it is. I think it's always useful uh, and important to have it because there are people for whom it is important. Yeah, I think Ken and I have been working on this for some time and I think you're right. Once we write down these things, then the task is to compare all these things that people want to call holograms and classify them. Yes, they are or no, they're not. And and that that's going to take it, it's going to take some evolution. And Linda, you're talking about moving. We make digital holographic movies. That's been done for many years. People and holographic movies themselves, even on film, have been made for years. So we have cameras now that can record a, a million frames, a million holograms per second of an explosion. You can take something that's exploding. You can track in time very precisely in three dimensions from those holograms exactly how everything is moving in 3D. So there are there are digital holographic movies. Holographic microscopy is a big field now. People are track, tracking um, uh, microbes in in 3D on the micron level. So it it is a big business now. Holographic movies. Well, that's fascinating in itself, and that, but but your definition of, of a holographic movie on that level is not quite what the rest of the public thinks of as as perhaps as a holographic movie. Yeah, um, we don't sit around at night watching that. <laughs> right. But I, there's another uh, a comment here from George Tadnick. Uh, Interference and diffraction are the attributes of light that are manipulated to create holograms but aren't synthesized also simulations of an, of an optical hologram or are they a category unto themselves? Yeah, I'd like to call them holograms, whether okay. the wave fronts are simulated or whether they're real, but it's still, it's using the, the properties of interference and diffraction to record that whole, that wave front. And it's a hologram of something. Uh, yeah. Maybe I could um, give a slightly different definition than I uh, gave first time. Uh, maybe a hologram could be defined as a recording that recreates three-dimensional images. 
in uh, not specify whether it's a interference recording or whatever, but simply that it uh, recreates three-dimensional images. But you don't need to have images. Uh, there are a lot of holographic, a lot of uses for holography that, that don't involve images at all. They just involve wave fronts. See what happens to the wave front in three dimensions. The, mm -hmm. the study of, of aerodynamic flow fields, for example, you want yeah. to measure densities in the, the field. You, you never have an image of the field. You, you analyze this thing in 3D and fig, figure out what the density of the gas is. Yeah, well, if you recreate wave fronts, the, uh, then uh, that these wave fronts create images if, if that's what you had recorded originally. So yeah, I guess you could say holograms recreate wave fronts, but then it's not quite clear <clears throat> what is, uh, well, what do you see or what what's happens? But it's, but it's accurate because that's what makes up the image. Mm -hmm. I, I want a really interesting question here um, that just jumped out of my view. Let me see if I can get it back. Um, Linda, can you get the one about the computer-generated hologram? Is a computer-generated hologram a hologram the same way chocolate cake is a type of cake? You can see why it got my attention. Um, or is a computer-generated hologram a hologram the same way a cheesecake is a cake? What? I'm throwing that out to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just sent, a few days ago, I sent an email to both Uris and Ken. I said, if it, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. So if it looks like a hologram and it acts, it reconstructs wave fronts like a hologram, it's a hologram. <laughs> <laughs> um, something else here, a Dostatnik also commented, holograms also record time in that the viewer can spend time looking through the window and perceive the space at, at their own pace for an unlimited amount of time. And that's a really interesting observation too. Well, I think, I think that that's partially correct, if you'll pardon my saying that, whoever said that, um, in that the, the amount of time that one takes to view it is ancillary to the actual image. It has nothing to do with the time that is inherent in the image. Right. The time that's inherent in the image is the split second that it took to record it. So it's frozen, that, that word is- Frozen, word. right. I mean, unless you're dealing with an integral hologram, you know. Or, or uh, you can have a, a multi-channel hologram. You can have a multi-channel hologram, right. Put it at different moments of time. So you're actually looking at, into windows that are composed of different slices of time. But the, the person who is asking the question or stating the, the comment, which is well taken, um, is that it is, it's up to the viewer how much time they want to take to view it. It's not inherent mm -hmm. in the image. Yeah. How much time is displayed. Although if you want to warp it a little, there are different spaces. Oh. You look at Ken Dunkley's hologram right. thoughts, a hologram of a hologram of a hologram. Um, there are different, and, or Sam Murray's work, um, Dan Schweitzer's work. There are a lot of people who put holograms into a hologram as another image. And so there are different kinds of holographic space illustrated within the larger context of the space. But okay. time itself, I think, is a is a really different thing, and we have to move that over to, um, to the movie section because mm -hmm. it's not it's not what the observer talks about any more than the placement of the image um, has anything really to do with it. Whether it's you know. Um, you know, projected way out, or it's got an immense amount of space behind the, or, or straddling the image plane. Those are, are strict decrees that are set by the camera that took the image. Um, they're not particularly inherent 
uh, their decisions that people made, creative decisions they made about where they want that image. Um, so, so why? Can't, so we should work on the concept of frozen. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Frozen. It captures. It captures a second in time, just like a um, strobe camera would uh -huh. capture a second in time. You okay. might say a hologram is a window into another space and a different time. I mean, if you're looking at the hologram, you're seeing a edit, you're seeing what was there at some previous time. So it's it's a window into a different space and time. And it, because it allows you, I'll, I'll pick off on the on the whoever made that comment. Um, remember the old conductor on hologram of of the uh, somebody spitting water out of their mouth. And all the droplets of water are hanging in space and have the reverse image of the person doing the spitting of the water in them. Fascinating. I mean, you, you don't get that opportunity in real life. You can't stop gravity and say, hold on, I want to look at the 82 different images here. You know, that's, that's something that a hologram uh, freezing, as you say, time and space together allows you to see images that are so fleeting. And uh, Jim, when you talk about, about imaging, um, the patterns of spray, uh, jet spray no nozzles or whatever it was that you were talking about the other day. You know, I get that. I get that that would be an incredible thing to be able to, you could literally measure every single little droplet. You could see them. Of course, it's happening so fast in real time um, that you can't measure it or even look at it. Um, but that that's that freezing of time, it, it is a word that applies, I think. Um, a static image, you know, yeah, but, but a fleeting image that is captured, um, that's revolutionary. I mean, to capture it spatially is amazing. So frozen's a good word. It works. I have another comment here from, um, I think, oops, it's frozen, uh, from Rob Monday. I agree with Eurus, Ken, and Jim, but a single, but a hologram of a single point of light is a diffractive zone plate. A Fresnel lens can do the same, same using reflective surfaces. Digital holograms can therefore be made that don't utilize diffraction at all, which further scuppers the definition somewhat. Any comments on that one? Oh. <laughs> I don't know what he means. <laughs> I think a Fresnel lens works by not diffraction, but from refraction. It's actually a composite lens. I think there's such a thing as a holographic lens. In fact, that's another one that, that Dennis Yuck mentioned. He said a hologram of a convex mirror yeah. acts exactly like a convex mirror. So. There is a difference in a Fresnel lens and a hologram of a lens. So when you say exactly, you're saying it has the same optical properties. It's the same imaging properties. Yeah, yes. Imaging properties. Okay. Uh, I have another comment here from Bob Hess. Um, a hologram is a light field display. Not all light field displays are holographic. What's yeah, that's, that's, it works for light. What's, yeah, what's the light field? Sounds about right. <laughs> um, Ken, I love the fact that you have trouble with that because you all roll out some phrases that make my eyes roll too. So, you know, I'm glad that light field does that to you. Can you tell me what you think a light field is? I haven't got a clue. Oh. I think I said the other day that it seemed like a weather front to me. But <laughs> <laughs> me too. Um, I'm looking for more questions here. Uh, Fran Francesco Mazzaro says, in holography, there is writing or even recording a wavefront. Holography, uh, in, in holography, there is writing of oh, there is writing or recording of a wavefront. It was replicated. Um, and George Stadnick says, 
holography tree with branches of the variants and evolutionary forms could illustrate the complexity with context. Um, I'm getting lots of comments about cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if somebody wants to talk about that, please. Uh, what saying. Uh, does, in, in terms of the audience, oh. does anybody, can I ask out that we've, we've got another uh, 10 minutes or so here. Uh, if you have any specific questions you want to or ask of the panelists, this is the point in time to, to put them in. I'm, I'm scanning through the, the uh, questions at the moment. Um, There's actually, Linda, there are a couple of questions under the Q&A thing. Okay. Um, digitally constructed, uh, this is from Colin Suba, with digitally constructed objects becoming so common, as well as digital displays, will, quote, real object holography and film persist as a medium? Mm. That's a good question. Um, Actually, I'd like to to add in there that um, my own personal experience of late has been that I see more and more young people getting very interested in optical holography as well as digital holography. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen both and I see one stimulating the other. So actually one of the things we're doing is um, I'm working with Melissa Crenshaw to put a, a, an online course about making optical holograms using Denisov techniques, single beam techniques and working, recording with laser diodes into photopolymer. So we see this as another way to get more people involved on an entry level because photopolymer, no processing chemistry. May what? And no processing chemistry. We can make it with a laser diode and work with photopolymer now. Now we could have done that 40 years ago. We could, but it wasn't commercially available. <laughs> yes, it was. Yeah. I used it all the time. Okay. <laughs> well, it wasn't available packaged for an individual to go and buy from a company. You were buying as a company from another company. So you had inside track on this, Ken, we, right? We were until they decided to compete with us and everything fell apart. Okay. That's just a history. Got another question here. Uh, maybe Uris, you could tackle this one from Owen Meal. How would you advise an early career engineer interested in holography and optics? Hmm. Actually, all three of you could probably. Not me. Well, you have to find someone that's interested. Of course, if you want to work in this field, then you have to find somebody that's giving is willing to give money or pay, pay your salary and so on. So <laughs> yeah. if you don't have a sponsorship, then it's pretty hard, you know, as a hobby, you can do it, but uh, as a, otherwise. Uh, Yours, is, is sponsorship gone away? Are there still? Well, who's, is anyone doing holography like Iram was um, or SRI or, you know, back in the day all the uh, who's who's actually doing uh quote industrial or scientific holography these days mm -hmm. i haven't really followed the field <laughs> i don't know jim you're more involved jim? in the, that end of things what would you say the question is who's doing scientific holography or what was the question I... well the this um fellow wants to know you know how how would he get involved in oh oh yeah okay the first thing Where to do, do get know? get graham saxby's book on holography or get uh collier burkhart and that there, there are a lot of good books uh, a good place to start if you want to start really elementary you could start with fred unter sears holograms made the easy way. <clears throat> so there's a number of books to start with and there are a number mm -hmm. of universities teaching classes. So find some place and take some classes. Yeah. But are there any universities that are involved in research anymore? Like University of Arizona was or Michigan or those places? I, can't, I don't think there are. There must be some. Well, uh, yeah. um, De Montfort University in England has got Martin Richardson working there. And that was, I think that that was a lab initially established by Nick Phillips and that's still going. 
um, the M MIT's lab that had been Stephen Benton's that I think has pretty much folded up now. They line of short courses also. I know a number of universities. I, I can't name one at the moment, but there are there are universities that give short courses and special courses in holography. I think he was asking particularly as a career engineer, as opposed to you know, entering yeah. into more of a, an amateur or an artistic uh, approach with it. But there's um, his uh, Fred Needham has uh, put in the. Wikipedia definition of light field, which I might stir things up a little oh. too. Um, the light field is a vector function that describes the amount of light flowing in every direction through every point in space. The space of all possible light rays is given by the five dimensional planoptic function and the magnitude of each ray is given by the radiance. Okay, where did he say that was please? That was from Wikipedia. So hmm. does that answer your question, Ken? Yeah. yeah. If I take enough photographs, except that the light field may not may contain phase as well. If it does, then the photographs don't do it. Then it's different than my infinite number of photographs. Okay, I'll look it up. There's another interesting question here too. How, uh, this is from um, Kel D. How, how much time does a hologram actually record? Is it a true 0. 0.000 whatever amount of time or is it a measurable but imperceptible amount of time? Well, the fastest you can record is whatever the exposure is. The, the fastest I know of is in digital holography, we have cameras that'll go down to a little bit less than a microsecond exposure. So you can, I don't think you can freeze time with scientific instruments much better than a microsecond or maybe maybe a nano of this the shortest lasers are like femtoseconds so you could record a whole and yeah in fact we made some holograms with femtosecond lasers so now you're talking about stopping time to 10 to the minus 12 seconds wow mm -hmm. um i have a couple of comments here too that are are uh, interesting shoshona goldberg miller says um how can holography be used more widely by artists now? And that was followed up by Mark Diamond saying, Shoshona, formula has remained the same. Add money and stir. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Uris said that too. You find a sponsor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. um, it's never been easy, but it is possible. Eurus and I were paid full time, and we had the luxury of working in a holography. And we had the luxury of taking any course at the University of Michigan free. Hmm. That's and that went on for a number of years. Most of the people who were asking about opportunities, not the original question. Yeah. <laughs> but but you, you, and you were not you were not artists. Yeah. Art, were not artists. artists yeah. I'm, I've been paid full time for 50 years and I've done almost nothing but holography. So but but I am an artist also. So it's uh I I didn't I never made any money with art. <laughs> Well, I think we're moving into a new era right now with all of the stuff that's happening with um, digital holographic displays, although people, there are a number of people out there who have a problem with that term. But I think we're seeing an, an evolving field here right now. And uh, it's gonna be a really big, big money field as we go forward. The are there any recommendations that we should be looking at? I mean, if Jim and I are looking at, well, namely Jim, he's carrying the ball on this, trying to define holography, are, are we going in a, should we be going in a different direction? Posey mentioned, and we haven't got there yet, that we have to do it for the general public. And that's the next step, isn't it, Jim? Or you've already done a lot there. I think there are always gonna be two tracks. There is yeah. always gonna be research 
There, there are always going to be industrial commercial uses for holography, and there are always going to be artists, and they are not necessarily on the same track, and that's okay. I mean, yeah, look at the, 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 defini the definitions don't have to conflict with each other. They can, yeah. they can both be correct. Well, we yeah, have I'm, two minutes left here. Uh, maybe I could uh, amend uh, the definition I mentioned earlier and uh, take out the words interference uh, between reference beam, etc., and simply say that the hologram is a recording that recreates three dimensional images. And it doesn't matter how you, how it's made or recreated, but that it uh, generates space in three dimensional images and are not uh, restricted to the interference pattern. And then it would include computer generated holograms too. Well, you don't like my definition, eh? And uh, your holograms. definition? A hologram is a complete recording of a complex wavefront, which can be used at a later time to regenerate a perfect copy of that wave. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's fine too. I think we have that definition for the people who know what a wavefront is, and we have uh, something more like Posey's definition for <laughs> a person who had no a idea wave what wave. a light wave is. <laughs> Well, perhaps on that note, we can sum up here now. And I would like to thank all of you for participating here today. And for those of you that joined us today, I feel extremely honored to have had your company and to have this opportunity for you to share with it, with the audience we have out there in the world. Um, and um, I invite all of you to come to our next seminar, which is going to be in June, and we will be also discussing what is a hologram, but in this next panel, we'll be with a panel of holographic artists. Mm. So, um, in, on and the three of you have to come <laughs> and, be, and be as dazzled by that <laughs> as I am by your immense knowledge. Okay, it it will be on June fifteenth. That's the whole. That's our second seminar in this series, and I look forward to seeing many of you there too, including all of my participants today. And thank you so much for being with us. I've enjoyed some of the comments and I, I recognize a lot of names on the comments. I haven't been able to read all of them, but it, if there's some way to get a copy of those comments, that would be really interesting. And I the will, question. I'll send it all to you. You will all get a copy of it. If, if I may, um, you're not gonna like me for this, but you know, I make a habit of, opening my mouth and putting my foot in it. Um, I think that one of the things that Uris talked about is really an important issue for all of us right now, and that is sponsorship. Um, what, what Linda is trying to undertake right now uh, is an immense project to put together a virtual museum of holography. It ain't gonna happen on peanuts, okay? Um, so all of you who are listening, all of you who are involved in the field in one way or another. Um, trust me, museums of holography do not happen by magic. They are not wavefront interference. They are involved in coin of the realm. And so if you want to see the history of holography preserved, if you want to see uh, a meeting place for people to ask the kinds of questions, that you all are asking right now. Um, if you want to have uh, a presence of, of rational definition um, available to check on, then we all have to pony up. We have to pony up some money to make this happen because we're at a very, very tenuous stage right now um, in the history of holography where a, a great deal of really important holographic work is just plain gonna disappear. Either it's gonna fall off the plate or it's gonna get thrown away. People are disappearing off the face of the earth. Um, you can see the color of all of our hair. And um, you know it's important to get these stories written down, to collect this work, 
to preserve this work, to help new people learn where they can learn about holography. There were a bunch of good suggestions. Michael Page, thank you for that. Um, Sam Murray teaching holography. A lot of people doing the work. Um, but to have a center to disseminate that information, to show holograms, to be involved in archival study, this is crucial. If we want the history of holography to survive, we have to make that happen. And that means write a check. Sorry, but that's, that's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. uh, the, all of us who take it seriously need to take it seriously on a piece of paper uh, called a check. You know, or or however you to go fund me or whatever all that electronic stuff is. Um, we need to support this field. We need to support the people who are working in it, because otherwise, it won't be there. It won't be there in twenty or thirty years, and neither will we to be able to tell the stories. So it's really important that we support an archival effort now. Thank you. Well, on that note, uh, <laughs> I look forward to all of you joining us next time around and um, supporting us as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, all of you. Nice Thank to you see all of you. Coming. <laughs> and on that note, Mac. goodbye. <laughs>